thank you so much for, for joining us today. Thank you, um, Hendrik. Um, and thank you, thank you all for attending this uh, webinar. Um, so um, this is a great opportunity for me to share some of our recent work in data-driven design of material systems with I think majority of the audience here are very interested in data-driven methods for materials. So I like to acknowledge the, uh, the collaboration from many of my colleagues here, including uh, student collaborator, faculty collaborator, as well as industry collaborator. Uh, this is really a, I would call it a multidisciplinary effort. Um, during the past decade, I have been collaborating with my colleagues in mechanics, in materials, and also in manufacturing. So this work I'm presenting here really reflects the uh, really the power of this interdisciplinary collaborations. So I'm showing you here a uh, wide range of uh, uh, material system that we have been working on during the past uh, couple of years. And this range from soft material like polymer system to hard material like the edit in additive manufacturing, um, as well as um, a combined, we call the hybrid system that could be like composite materials. And um, what is common um, of all this system here is that in addition to design for material constituents, and there's also a big part of the design decision is about the architecture of the material, we call the structure of the material to achieve a certain special function and the properties. So my talk today, I, it's more coming from a uh, engineering design researchers point of view. I know that uh, we have a very broad audience here. Uh, many of you may be coming from materials mechanics. Um, so you can see that really from the lens of the engineering design researcher today, what are the, some of the things that we care about? And I like to use two example system to kind of explain the challenges of such kind of problem. One problem, one project is the one that we, it's already finished uh, under support of DOE in collaboration with Ford Motor Company to design lightweight uh, composite structures. So from the design point of view, um, their decision can be made across all scale level, including nanoscale, you have to choose what kind of uh, uh, elastomer you, you can use, epoxy basically, what kind of epoxy and then the fiber, um, the type of uh, fiber system. And then at the mesoscale level, you face design decisions such as um, the thickness of the lamination, the angle of the fiber, basically the architecture of the lamination. And upper scale level, you talk about the topology design of the structures. So this is a very complex problem and the complexity, part of it is introduced by the manufacturing process. If you think about it, the manufacturing process involved and at each different location, it's a thermal plastic process, right? And each different location, the material structure is going to be different. So cross over the whole parts, uh, there's a huge heterogeneity and we call this spatially and also temporary varying uh, microstructure and properties. And uh, so when we think about material law, we have to think about the, the, the uncertainty associated with that. Um, and also on, on the information side, we are uh, gathering information from both the, the experiments as well with the computer simulations. So in order to synthesize all this information in designing such a multi-scale system is very complex. And similar challenges are faced in another example I'm showing here working with my colleagues is in the additive manufacturing field. And the simulation of additive manufacturing from process to structure, to property, and the performance um, is becoming more mature these years. On the other hand, if you want to do a concurrent design of process together with material and also the part shape topology, um, that is a big challenge problem that I don't think anyone has conquered uh, such type of you know, challenge. Or I haven't seen any published work on you know, doing all this design together. And the reason behind that is again, the similar issue that I brought up earlier, like stochasticity, the information heterogeneity, uh, the multi-scale complexity, location dependency. Uh, that's another big challenge as well as non-linearity. So um, during the recent years, um, you, have, you probably know this, this 
interdisciplinary field called ICME, right? And this field has emerged. It's, it's a very interdisciplinary because it involves issue of integrating data science, multi, uh, materials modeling, as well as manufacturing to design and deploy advanced material system. You know, from my perspective, I'm a mechanical engineer. So I'm very interested in the issues about deployment, right? Design and also deploy uh, the system that material that can be used in a system that achieves certain performance and function. And the, the need of the, this kind of research is also um, evident in this initiative called the Material Genome MGI Initiative. So from the, the modeling perspective, we're talking about uh, there's a mapping between process to structure to property to performance. And for the design perspective, it's more like an inverse process that we're looking at some desired, we have some desired target, right, for the performance and how do we infer what is optimal property to structure and to processing. Um, uh, so related to this is that um, um, there's actually a, uh, we call it a concentrated effort of building large data resource, okay, to accomplish, you know, the goal of the MGI. And uh, I want to point it out that I'm personally involved in a NSF supported the CSSI project involving uh, six different universities. And uh, Kate Brinsome is the lead PI for this uh, effort to build the data resource for polymer nanocomposite as well as expanding it to metamaterial systems. Uh, this is a very busy chat that we use to show, to kind of present our project. And if you look at it, it's actually, there's a lot of interaction is with the computer science. A big part of the work behind the data resource uh, building, build the resources actually determine the ontology, like knowledge graph, the data schema. And many of those things have to be built on uh, the domain, the application domain's needs. Um, and behind the scene, there's always a question about what is the framework, right? What is the kind of framework you want to, depending on you know, uh, where you're coming from and the, the design framework can be different and then the system can also be different. So there's an important question to answer before we can even build the data system, we first want to see what is the purpose, right, of building the system. And gaining knowledge is one big part of it, and the design is another um, major motivation of building such kind of data resources. So from the designer's uh, lens- uh, sir, We can ask a quick question. Uh, so yeah. Yeah, could you go back to the previous slide? So I'm just wondering there when you talk about the materials knowledge graph and what does usually their each node represent and also the edge represent? Oh, okay. So these are different entities in our system. For example, it can be one node it can be the property you know, of a material. Another node can be in our case is microstructure because we're using like imaging analysis. So, and so this, and another note can be performance. Yeah. So mm -hmm. just give you an example. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And from the designer's lens, there are mainly three major categories of research uh, that's involved. One is the design representation. Another is the design evaluation and then the design synthesis. So we're developing methods for each of those categories. And design representation basically try to extract information from the material database to, to determine what is the best representation for your design variables, right? And if you think about the work you've seen in the material area, you probably have seen representations such as composition, descriptors, correlation function, you know, the crystal graph of, uh, you know, material as well as some, uh, the smiles, right? Smiles is a representation for the chemistry design. So there's many different representation people use as control factors or the design variables. And at the design evaluation side, you see methods such as MD simulation, DFT, find the element. And the one big question here is always like, how do we incorporate the information from both simulation experiments to do calibration and then validation? Once the model is built, then the design synthesis is using methods such as genetic algorithm, deep learning, Bayesian optimization, and also impose constraints and the bounds associated with the manufacturability and so on. And I also, also want to point it out that there's a lot of interrelated topics, right, of these different domains here. I'm giving just a few examples 
of the things my group is interested. For example, between design evaluation, design synthesis, we're interested in uncertainty quantification, right? And also take into account the noise of the computer simulation and the computational cost. And this issue about length and scale of phenomenon between design representation, design evaluation, and in between design representation, design synthesis, currently we're working on methods can uh, find a solution for both qualitative as well as quantitative variables. So we call it mixture of design variables. So um, I, I, I think, you know, you can, you may be able to relate to your own work, you know, into any of those uh, parts here, but maybe some of those are interrelated topics. And the summary here gives some examples of the most frequently used methods um, in this area. So in the next um, maybe uh, like 40 or 30, 40 minutes, I'm going to go over each of those block and show you some representative work uh, from my group. And today's discussion, instead of focus on one paper to explain the method in a good level of detail, I actually like to go over a wide range of work. And so, so you can have a sense about what are the, some of the popular methods that uh, my group and as well that I think other groups are using. I kind of feel the community has converged on uh, some of the most useful methods um, in this domain. So the first topic is we call the MCR, microstructure characterization and reconstruction. This is very important when we want to consider phenomenon at the lower scale level and when we want to do material design. So characterization is to use <coughs> image-based method to extract information and to, to come up with representation. And the reconstruction is try to build statistically equivalent microstructure so that you can feed them to computer simulations. So I listed the two representative work here uh, that for your information. So there are two different major uh, category of method. One is deterministic representation. So you can think about topology optimization offers or builds on the deterministic representation that the variable here is basically using material, not using material, so zero, one, right? So that's your design variable. But it will lead to a very high dimensional design space and the, the manufacturing process can also be very expensive. So on the other hand, uh, the statistical representation use methods such as correlation function, descriptor based or supervised learning methods. They can deal with much more complex morphology that's close to the real material system and the using manufacturing process that are um, much more easier to produce large quantity that we call mass production. For example, methods such as mixing, right? Um, like mixing the different material together. That's a process that mostly statistically can be represented statistically. So, um, so there's, I'll give you one example of actually how our methods evolve. And initially, when we look at this problem like solar cell design, and that the, when we look at this system, um, to, to design thin field solar cell, it's a very challenging problem that you actually need to control the light path so that it can be fully contained in the very thin film. And, uh, and this can be accomplished by what we call 2D material design, the surface pattern design. And initially, we, I worked with my colleague, Professor Chen Sun, who is an expert in nanolithography. So we use topology optimization. Okay? This is optimized at the system. Um, by maximizing the absorption rate. And you can see the profile of a design that the blue color represents the, uh, the result from computer simulation uh, throughout the day when the wavelengths change, we're optimizing the total, the sum of the maximum absorption throughout the day. And the fabricated sample, that's the real thing you get from the, the system. And uh, that's the red color. You can see some discrepancy, but not huge. And the, the green one is really just a random design. So you can see optimization can help us tremendously improving the performance. But on the other hand, we also find that this is a very difficult to fabricate, very costly. If you use topology optimization for such lower scale system, it takes like a, a week just to pattern something on like four inch wafer. So it's not very feasible. So throughout the years, I will actually, I will, approach also evolved from this deterministic to what we call the quasi-random representation, largely inspired the biological system. Like this is the, uh, the feather of a bird and the pecan. And um, you can see actually underneath a very colorful uh, structure, 
a color for uh, like a feather, or this is a moth eye, underlying that is very periodic structure design. And the blue bird, this is a, like a biocontinuous, more like a biocontinuous system. It looks a lot random, but it actually has some pattern underneath it. And then when it becomes very random, you can see the color uh, becomes ultra white. So there's a strong relationship between the structure and in this case is the optical property. And we found that this kind of thing, um, like this kind of, uh, you know, mapping or relationship exists for other artificial man-made system. You know, here is a system for achieve different color. You know, instead of using the chemical dye, you actually can change the, the structure to achieve certain color. And uh, this is a wrinkling system to accomplish called anti-wet film. Um, it's like a lotus, right? Um, and then um, you can really manipulate your structure to accomplish uh, this goal. So an interesting thing we find is that underlying this uh, very messy structure, actually there's a very simple representation called the structure spectral density function. So looking at this picture, you can see that um, a very messy structure like this on the left, after you do a Fourier transformation, it becomes a step function, okay? And this is a huge dimension reduction. And from the design perspective, it means that we only need to design the lower bound and upper bound of this step function. Yeah, and then um, it's also interesting that uh, the design is not a one-to-one -one mapping. So to, from the property perspective, you only need to accomplish the spectral density function shape like this. But um, if you look at the system, there's multiple way, you know, to accomplish this property. So there could be this like a particle based dot system and could be more like a channel type kind of a material system. And they share very similar property. I think that's, a, that's something we all know in design, right? The inverse mapping is not one to one. But what is used for is that we found that this spectral density function actually represents a signature for the manufacturing process. You know, I mentioned very early that, you know, my interest is always not just optimize the structure, but also making sure we're able to make it, right? So if you look at, you know, this four, three different process, focused eye beam, phase separation, and nano wrinkling, and if you collect a sample, you know, from those different uh, systems, you can see that they share, they, they're very different. These three systems are very different uh, in the spectral density function. But on the other hand, for a particular, you know, process, you're going to see that even if you change your process condition, the underlying spectral density function is very similar. So this tells us that we could actually start from the process and identify the, the kind of uh, the, the, the right, uh, the, the corresponding, you know, representation, the spectral density function representation, and then use that for design purpose. So we can change the variable in those function and accomplish different uh, struct, different property. And this is a huge dimension reduction compared to design the, the, you know, the original structure using methods such as topology optimization. So this work published with um, Car uh, Terry Oden's group. Terry Oden is a chemistry material professor in, in at Northwestern. So her group have this nice uh, process that's called wrinkling. It's like, uh, you can Im imagine that you you grab a piece of paper, right? And you make a wrinkle from there. And depends on the, the wrinkle spacing and the things like that, it can accomplish very different uh, optical property. In this case, we try to design the solar cell to maximize the, the energy absorption. So for this system, the wrinkling process, only two variables are critical. One is the peak value of the spectral density function. Another is the variance and of this uh, shape here. And we also find that correspondingly, um, the, um, this peak value is corresponding to the, the wavelengths of the wrinkles. Um, and also um, there's a, things like etching time corresponds very well with the volume fraction. So we could actually found for this particular problem, a one-one mapping between the processing parameter and the, the uh, structure variables. So we use optimization to identify the optimum uh, spectral density function for the peak value and the variance, so mean and the delta, and then inversely, we find the corresponding optimal uh, processing condition. Um, I don't have the slides here, but uh, in our published paper, we showed that the, that the optimal solution, we actually fabricated that and the validated the performance uh, against the, the theoretical result. 
So um, coming um, just a little bit more on the, uh, the MCR subject, um, there's also there's a great potential of using deep learning technique. So here I show that using transfer learning, we could actually do microstructure reconstruction. So we start from one image, we can use a uh, build a, a neural network based on library that's a feature extractor. There's a very well-known image net, VGG19. People created this uh, neural network data, uh, like a system based on image like cats and dogs and things you observe in the nature, nothing to do with material. But on the other hand, uh, the material system, we actually tested on many different material system. Using one image, we can realize multiple, we can uh, implement multiple realizations of the structure. And the same um, an approach can also be like using generative design method, the GAN approach, we can use this for a material design. So using the latent variable identifying the GAN uh, neural network, we, uh, deep network, deep neural network, we could actually uh, design new material to accomplish uh, certain properties. So here I show you one example of uh, the, the, there is the, this, uh, really this power of this uh, deep learning technique. This is the original image. It's a real image from a uh, bio, uh, like copolymer, okay? It's a very tough problem because it's like a finger, like it's a fingerprint, right? It's like, a, it's very messy. There's no descriptor really can describe such kind of system. But using the deep convolution network, the transfer learning method, you can see that the, the reconstruction quality is very good. We actually have metric uh, that measure how good it is, like in terms of the, the statistical correlation function. And some other competing method like supervised learning, Gaussian random process, two point correlation function is just too far from you know, the actual system. And the physical descriptor is not possible you know, for this kind of uh, very uh, complex microstructure. So there's a paper we published in Progress in Material Science uh, several years ago, compare different methods we looked at, and we uh, we are not saying which method is the best, but we are trying to look at them from different perspective. For example, whether the method can handle irregular geometry, uh, what is the reconstruction speed, right? We do care about the speed because it's part of the design process, whether it can handle multiple phase, uh, whether it can take information from 2D to 3D very quickly, and also whether it can provide a physically meaningful um, interpretation of those parameters. And that's also related to how easily they can be mapped to some of the processing conditions that we're interested in. So now I'll move to the subject. The second topic is the design evaluation. And this is a very widely examined topic um, that uh, we see a lot of paper published these days and many different kinds of machine learning neural network technique have been used. What I want to point it out is that in this area, there are really two categories of approach. Uh, one category is to use very, we call the big data approach. Okay, I will show you an example that the big data is very applicable for building the plasticity, uh, computing the plasticity behavior. Okay, and another case which we uh, uh, like uh, encounter many times in the design situation is we have very small data. So each simulation is very expensive. So how do we use, you know, smart, how do we deal with both situations? That's something that we're interested in. So the challenge in this key area, again, it's related to temporal, spatial, and also um, when we think about the mechanical behavior or the behavior, there's load pass dependency, okay? Um, there's expense, okay? So that's the reason we can't afford lots of data. And the, the other, another major challenge is that many existing method, you really have to, determining um, subjectively what are the descriptors, what are the you know, inputs you're going to use in machine learning. So we call them handcrafted descriptors, right? And uh, so in some cases, we really don't know. And then we try many, many of them to see what, what are real, the important one. So we also try to develop, in our work, we actually try to develop methods kind of bypass okay, that step and, um, um, and the relate the design solution directly to the, uh, to the performance of interest. And uncertainty, of course, is another uh, big challenge uh, in this area. So um, I want to give you some flavor of the work um, in terms of the big data, right? I mentioned earlier that we applied the, the big data approach to, uh, the, 
determine the plasticity behavior. So you can see that in this case, the, the ultimate goal is to assess a very, you know, like a performance of a structure, say a woven composite or something like that. But at each point, right, there's a material law we call the constituted relation that you need to follow. So um, I, I think it is a growing trend to use surrogate model, right, to, to build the surrogate model so you can reuse them at the different locations. And the different location, the material structure can be different and the load path can be different, right? So the inputs include the boundary condition. They can be different, different location. Um, the microstructure uh, descriptor can be different. The constituent property can be different. Okay, so this is the machine learning model that we want to build so that it can surrogate the material law and can be reused at the different location when we assess the performance of a structure. So this is a paper also published in at PNNS um, that use a sequential deep learning approach, right? The uh, recursive neural network. And the, the data sample is very large, like 15,000, but it's not very expensive to, to do the simulation, okay? We could actually gather lots of data points uh, up front. This is called offline simulation. And then once we build this relationship, we actually found the validation and the prediction match exactly, okay? Very accuracy is superb. And once we build a such kind of a relationship of the material law, we could actually derive uh, for the yield surface, okay, evolution under different loading. You know, traditionally this kind of surface is, is derived based on physical simulation, okay? And it's very expensive to do physical, uh, not physical simulation, physical experiments, okay? And here we could actually show that using computer simulation, we can just derive the, the, the yield surface and then uh, use that information further for uh, like a performance assessment. So this is the big data. But the, on the other hand, we countered issue, many of the cases we have is we don't have enough data, right? So here's an example of uh, my collaboration with a colleague in material science in designing a metal insulator transistor. And this kind of problem have very large space, like uh, in the millions of the range because the material can be each location of this. This is one material family called the Lucana spinel, right? It is represented by this thing called A, B, X. And then this is the ratio of the different uh, uh, like elements. And each location, it can be, it can have many, many choice, you know, in this chemistry table, right? So combinatorially, like it's a combinatorial problem, right? If you combine all the possibility, it's like millions, uh, billions of choices. Um, so this is, I call this problem is finding the needle in the hay, right? Um, and on the other hand, what we see is that the material we know in the literature, usually they're very far away, you know, from the design target that we want. So we need a method which can go beyond, you know, the things we know and go to the location that, uh, that, uh, the, that we have no knowledge about. So to develop this kind of technique dealing with small data problem, we actually, uh, in our research, we promote a method called the Gaussian process. And the Gaussian process is a technique that can collect the data and can fit a model that not only pass through all this data, but can also give you uncertainty quantification at the location that you do not have the, the, any data points. And this location is important for uh, a sequential, using sequential sampling strategy in an adaptive way, right? And relating to this is the concept called the Bayesian optimization. Uh, I believe many of you here may be very familiar with this. Um, and just going through a little bit about the, the technique behind it is that, you know, you start with some, with some simulation and you fit a Gaussian process model. And after that, you need some kind of acquisition function to determine what's the next sampling point. And so if you consider both exploration, which is considered uncertainty and exploitation, which is for improving the objective function, there's a balance between the two. So the acquisition function, one commonly used one is expected improvement. And they look at both this need and determine the, the next point. And this point will be added to the sampling and this model will be updated, right? And this process is called the Bayesian optimization until you get something that is close to your optimal. And this method is very powerful for a very highly nonlinear behavior that we have lots of local solution or um, like things that be, may be differentiable 
that you're not able to do lots of the gradient calculations. So um, in the literature, most of the method Bayesian optimization relies on Gaussian random process, which is only fit for continuous variables. And in our work, we actually recently, the re most recent research in this work, we're actually looking at how do we come up with a model, a Gaussian process model for uh, the design space that is a mixture, we call mixed variable, can be both continuous as well as um, a category. So um, the, the need for this work um, can be illustrated by just this material design problem that I mentioned earlier, right? And this design of this material called the MIT, like a metal insulator material, you have to make a decision of the composition of the material. So there's a lot of level uh, for each of those locations. And um, if you use uh, the traditional machine learning, um, like a DFT based machine learning, you have to pick descriptors, right? You have to come up with some features that as input. So our method actually can bypass this step. We acknowledge in that underneath of all this design concept, different level, there's actually a quantitative space, which is high dimensional. So you can use descriptor like atomic radius, uh, ionization energy and those things, right? But oftentimes we do not know this space. So what our approach is going to bypass this step, the rather we're going to find the latent variable location that kind of um, map um, this um, qualitative variable into a quantitative uh, space. So the idea here is to revising the maximum likelihood function in addition to the, the continuous part. We're adding a part that is basically find the location of the variable of the latent variable in the latent space. And this latent space is much smaller. In our work, we actually found that two latent variable, two dimensional is quite sufficient to capture uh, the very complex phenomenon. And once this space it, once this location is fine, the distance actually tell us the differences in the design with respect to their impact on the performance of interest. So it is like a dimension reduction. And at the same time, it also provides the, we call the principal Bayesian statistical representation because the Gaussian random process will, uh, will provide us a certain quantification at any location of interest. So it really provides an easy way to connect with uh, like uh, experimental calibration or fusing different data from low fidelity and high fidelity as well as Bayesian optimization. So just to show you some example about how powerful uh, the efficiency of this method, we applied this method to uh, this MIT material design for the uh, Locana spinal family. In this case, for each of those location, you have multiple level you can choose. So in combination, there are about 270 candidate compounds. And each of those DFD simulation actually takes days. Okay, it's, it's on a supercomputer. It's not a, um, um, you know, on a regular computer. It takes days to do one simulation. So using the um, GP method, we call the mixed variable, uh, latent variable Gaussian process method, we actually can find the, for single objective design, we only use about 10 simulation points, we can identify the solution. And for multiple objective, we are trying to uh, find the Pareto frontier. So in this case, using um, um, about 60 simulation, okay, we are able to identify 12 compounds in the Pareto frontier that has a trade-off between the band gap and stability. And what is interesting is that the latent space also give us, uh, let us gain more knowledge in terms of the differences in the material. For example, this is a latent space for about this category variable, the MA set site. Okay. At this site, we have several, six different options. So this curve, this two picture shows how this different material concept are different in terms of their impact on the stability and in terms of their impact on the band gap. And you can see that, um, that the step, you know, the, the chromium, uh, this is a material that is very different in both this space. This material is very different from the other materials. And there's some materials are very close by. And we initially, we try to see whether there's any correlation with the chemistry table, they're, they're neighboring, whether the neighbors, right, are, are similar to each other. And our finding is that it's actually, it's not necessarily true, okay? So some of those that 
would, could be close by in the chemistry table, but some of them are very far away, you know, in the chemistry table when they're close in the, in the space. So this is give us a mapping between the really the latent space versus the, the property of interest and, uh, and also allow us to do sampling in a more efficient way. And we also applied this technique method to um, the nanocomposite structure design for nano dielectric. In this case, the categorical variable include the choice of polymer and the choice of surface treatment. Like you can use different surface treatment, right? So we're, we're no longer worrying about this descriptor, basically. We're dealing with those variables directly as inputs to our machine learning model, which is the GP model in this case. And our design variable are directly the choice, decision of the, you know, the choice of the surface treatment modification, also the choice of polymer. And then at the end, we are able to uh, also combine the physical experiments together with the computer simulation. This paper is published uh, in the molecular system design engineering and using also Bayesian optimization. So as I show here, I feel the Bayesian optimization has really converged. I think the community has really converged to that Bayesian optimization is a very powerful method for design purpose um, um, to, in order to determine how do we do sampling. Um, next, with another maybe five to 10 minutes, I want to quickly go over some of our recent work in building metamaterial data system, as well as multi-scale design using metamaterials. Um, I'm now going to introduce again what is really metamaterial. I think for many of people here knows about this. It's really, uh, the focus here is not only just to change the constituents, but changing the structure, right? To accomplish um, special uh, property in like the optical, thermal, acoustic, and other mechanics property. So if you think about this problem, you can think about that we're designing a structure, right? It's, we have to make a decision of topology, but each, each individual location, you also have a choice of the microstructure. And if you look at the existing design of a metal material system, they tend to use repeated, we call the period, periodic uh, microstructure design. But we know that's not the most efficient system. And the, the most efficient system is the one that you have your desired property at different location will be different. Okay, so here's the challenge of really pose a challenge of multi-scale design for a, a hybrid or heterogeneous system. So our idea is to use a data-driven methods. We first build a metal material database uh, that at the unit cell level. Okay, so we build lots of uh, unit block uh, uh, structure and that gave us a property. Um, so we're doing research on how do we construct this larger data set and considering both diversity in shapes and property. So we develop some metrics that we can measure uh, the diversity and also to choose. So the, the idea here is not necessarily using 10,000 samples, but maybe 1,000 sample from this 10,000 will be more effective than using all 10,000. So there's a choice of the data. And the next question we try to address is how do we build a machine learning model that can provide mechanics-based understanding? Right? What are the, the knowledge we can extract? And the last one is how do we assemble those unit blocks to design very complex structure we call the scalable uh, multi-scale design. And they're all well connected and they can be manufactured easily. Okay. So um, there's a multiple paper published recently and also we have database that's available at our lab website. So if you search, um, our, my lab is IDEAL, I-D-E-A-L in um, I-D-E-A-L dot M-E-C-H mechanical engineering at Northwestern, you're going to see there's a place you can actually request to, to download the, the data set we, we created. And we have many different ways to create a data set. An example here I showed is actually using topology optimization to first identi to identify unit block design corresponding different property, and then use a statistical shape perturbation method, try to go beyond this envelope. So you start from, some design from the optimization solution from topology optimization, and you gradually move up, you know, to go beyond this boundary. And then you um, do this iteratively until um, you kind of feel that there's no, there's a limit, right? There's always a limit, there's an envelope, you know, depending on your material property, you can never go beyond, right, this uh, envelope. And so here's the example to show that this is also a problem 
and with multi-response of interest. So we have, you know, um, here we're using the stiffness matrix, right, to represent this case, the multi-response is four of them, C11, C12, C22, C66. So those are the property we, we are referring to as a property. And you can see this 250,000, like how they are different, right, in this property space and what is the envelope. You can also observe, right, the envelope that it has created. And using machine learning methods such as a variational um, and um, autoencoder, here we're using the uh, adding a, re a regressor in the middle and using the encoder um, to identify latent space. And we create a, a really a, a mapping between the, the property as well as a structure. If you look at all those structures, they're very messy, right? But the machine learning will give you more structured understanding or mechanics-based understanding. For example, for some property, we find that the move, like the change from one uh, structure to another um, and corresponding to the property of interest is more like in a linear fashion, okay? And in some cases, for example, like a, a negative Poisson ratio as a property, this uh, path is not going to be very linear. It's very nonlinear path. So the path, here also allows to do inverse design more effectively because we want to say, given the property, right? What is the corresponding uh, ideal uh, topology? So such kind of mapping provide us more meaningful, uh, really um, mapping to the to the, the uh, to the original uh, geometrical space. So this paper is published the CA uh, the CAME the Computational Mechanics Journal in the. Uh, the AI special issue, uh, I think a couple months ago. Um, this just to show that the VAE also assisted inverse design and the inverse design can be just design unit block given some property as well as design a multi-scale structure. So for designing multi-scale structure, here's an example to show you that uh, how we benefit this larger database. So this is smiley face that you have a desired distortion, right, at the different location. And you can see that the desired property um, can be different. So the step one of our method is use topology optimization to identify the desired property at different location. And then after that, we uh, do a search in the database and also while ensuring the compatibility of the unit, neighboring unit cell. So we have some a metric and some algorithm that allow us to do this very efficient way, you know, to ex ex search, you know, this data system. So I show you some examples of uh, accomplished, you know, the design this is a smiley face. This is another example, you apply a load and the desired distortion is represented by the, the this curve here, right? And this is another example to show you that you can design a aperiodic um, structure at the end using the uh, the data system that we built. So I think uh, with that, I hope I give you some sense about some of the data-driven method that can be applied to uh, either more heterogeneous um, microstructure system versus more deterministic metamaterial system, right? There's two different kinds of system, but there's many methods are shared in common. Um, but in general, um, I would say that it's, it's a complex problem because it's very difficult to decompose material behavior from design manufacturing domain. And design and manufacturing are highly coupled um, in this kind of problem. So you have to think about how do you map okay, from one space to another. Um, this is an area that the stochasticity plays a critical role. Um, for that reason, um, the research in design and uncertainty um, can, can be quite useful. And the big data and the lack of data coexist um, in this area called material informatics. And um, the methods that we're all developing, uh, data-driven method, which is, and also we call information-centric approach, right? How we pick samples is based on the information, the quantification of the uncertainty, or some people call it value of information, right? Those kind of approach can really provide a significant, significant speeds up. And the final way that I think there's a lot of uh, collaboration between the computer science and the, 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 uh, the physics-based discipline try to develop explainable 
uh, deep learning methods, right? Try to help us really can explain the very complex phenomena. So with that, I just like to acknowledge the many different uh, various kind of support that we have been receiving from many different uh, agencies in the past uh, couple of years. So mm -hmm. how we're doing with the time? I think we still have some time that can allow people to ask some questions, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for this uh, beautiful and and very broad uh, talk. So that's uh, very nice. So, so let's open the floor for questions. I have a question. Um, thank you, Wei, for the really interesting talk. So um, I was just um, wondering, um, uh, you mentioned also using metrics to evaluate, for example, them in, in a lot of the systems, you ultimately have to either put in the loss function or evaluate how good the, the output is. So can you comment on that? What are some of the metrics you use in particular for the microstructure like at the beginning, the polymers? Because it seems that they have a lot of geometry in nature. Uh, is the metric usually mostly just the stochastic based? I mean, say color correlation between uh, for distances or um, or how do you encode the geometry over there? And um, do you think that um, this is a kind of, this is a metric in general is a solved problem or you think that um, the present the metric that used in the field are, is still not um, ideal? Yeah, so I, I try to see whether I understand your question uh, clearly. I think there mm -hmm. are different kinds of metric. If you talk mm -hmm. about property, okay, uh, for, for example, this is nano composite design for a nano dielectric material. Then we are optimizing properties such as breakdown strength, dielectric permittivity, and the dielectric loss. And some of those are mechanical property that can be simulated mm -hmm. by finite element analysis that I'm showing here, right? And some of the needs required if it's more to do with the electric dielectric property and breakdown strength, another one you will need very sophisticated uh, simulations, other methods. So mm -hmm. um, if you, so that's the metric at the right. property side. And right. the microstructure side for this problem, because the nanopolymer is more a particle system. So we're using, in this case, we're using a spectral density function as the representation. Mm -hmm. So that captures the dispersion status. So you can think about the spectral density function that I showed uh, earlier for the, the, uh, the solar cell, right? And that mm -hmm. kind of function actually captures the, um, the dispersion, like how far the particle apart from each right. other. As, also, mm -hmm. as well as volume fraction is always something that uh, it's a very important variable. So, and we also try the, we call the descriptor based approach for this kind of system. For example, minimum particle distances, both mean and variance, particle size, and the, those kind of things. But descriptor-based method restrict the system to be like ellipsoid, like a circular or ellipsoid. Mm -hmm. So, um, so and the, but the spectral density function does not. You could actually have the particle shape can, can be anything. Um, so how but sufficient it is, and we are doing, we're validating that based on experimental data. So we have uh, people who are in the team like uh, um, Linda Scheider from RPI, her group produced a lot of those systems using different uh, processing conditions. And we look at it, uh, we do microstructure you know, MCR methods, apply this method to the images we got from her group and then try to see whether a uh, particular representation is sufficient. So I think mm -hmm. it's always system dependent. You need to look at the, the physical data and then you can say, okay, you know, this representation kind of captures uh, the all kind of a spectrum uh, from this from this particular you know process. I don't know whether right. that answer your question, but I, I yeah I asking. think the second part is what I was asking. So oh. and also for the earlier this um, polymer like this other uh, example you showed earlier um, are those also you, you're using the spectral uh, density function to measure that ma the distance there as well? I think if you go to maybe slide um, uh, seventeen. So that's 17, okay. Uh -huh. Yeah, can you- Yeah, so for this type of, uh, uh, no, that was not. So you had some, uh, um, uh, I think it described some, 
this a functional polymer or something? Oh, like that. copolymer. Oh yeah, that's right. The copolymer. Copolymer okay. is seventeen. Yeah, this is copolymer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here. Mm -hmm. So this are also you use spectral domain. Uh, no, distance. this is not. This is mm -hmm. just a, uh, this is a reconstruction. So basically, this one this is the when we apply this transfer learning method. So right. start from uh, this images you see here using the network that's built. Right. You can generate. Right. Yeah, from the, but from then how do you evaluate that? Yeah, then? we, could, we mm -hmm. could create multiple realization of the uh, this original plot that has the same statistical property. So this one here, this is a reconstructed one using deep convolution network. And this mm -hmm. one, I don't, I don't have the diagram here. We can show that this one and this one here, they, sh they share the same statistical property basically. Yeah, so okay, that's so of reconstruction, right? Why do we do reconstruction? Is because we want to assess the material behavior um, in the statistical way. So I think you're right that the purpose here, you can see multiple realization depends on your property of interest. They, they sometimes they give you a very good, like if you interest in Young's modulus, okay, very little uncertainty if you do multiple realization. But if you're interested in some higher nonlinear Prop, like the uh, very um, property that is uh, beyond the linear region, then you can see the, the multiple realization will give you a large uncertainty in the prediction. So the reconstruction is for the purpose of uh, quantify the uncertainty of the property by doing multiple simulations. Got it, thank you. That's great. Yeah. Um, we have two questions from the chat window, really quick. So Mohammed uh, asked, uh, after designing an optimum multi-phase microstructure, is it feasible to manufacture 3D print uh, materials? Or yes, I, I think the, the 3D printing goes really well with the, the last topic I talk about is the meta material design, right? So if you, if you um, like uh, do this, yeah, we actually have, I'm collaborating with Kira Daria from Cartec. We are actually doing validation um, of the, the microstructure that we, we designed, uh, we optimized uh, using the, the database. And we're, you know, those things can be printed, yeah, using water jets or some other methods, yeah. So, so I, I see there's another question about this, uh, uh, multi-scale design. The question is uh, uh, aperiodic design, right? Start with building block, but how do you achieve the aperiodicity? So the periodicity is accomplished by identifying the desired property at the different locations. And once we know what is the desired property, we can go back to our database and find, um, I actually have a, a, another like a, a backup slides here that uh, shows, I skipped this one, that uh, you, um, we could actually search for um, what are the, you know, those in the database that match with the property. And then we use some uh, additional um, evaluation of the energy, nodal energy and the edge energy to assess the compatibility of different uh, unit cell in the neighborhood. And we develop algorithm, it's called the dual decomposition method to, to making sure that uh, the search is efficient. So at the end, you can see the solution here, each different location, they have very different uh, design, unit block design. And we have some other methods we use, it's not this strategy, we have actually multiple strategy of how we do this multi-scale. Another strategy is to link to the LVGP model that I talk about the mixed, uh, mixed, mixture variable problem, the latent variable, so we build a database and then we create a machine learning model as a function of the type of the unit block as well as the material property, uh, material variables such as thickness of wall infraction. And then we use that model linked together with the higher level topology optimization oriented algorithm. So in that case, we can also do multi-scale topology optimization using the similar computational has the similar computational efficiency as a single scale because we have a surrogate model, you know, for our unit block that we can actually bring into the high scale level. So that's in another paper uh, published in the Journal of Mechanical Design. So if you go to, 
if any of you are interested in this subject, go to our lab website and we have um, publications and go to, if you go to material system, uh, design of material system, we have uh, some of the recent publication listed uh, under that. Great. You can um, also request a data set if you're interested in trying out to do some machine learning on the data set that we, we created. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, one more question. What was very interesting is uh, this uh, method, you know, from the atomic scale problem, what you also call like search for the needle in the haystack, uh, then all the way to topology optimization, which is like searching for the needle in a much bigger haystack. <laughs> Then mm -hmm. how, how one can um, um, perhaps best uh, use more uniform approaches or correlated approaches to you know, bridge these multi-scale questions? Do you see opportunities or already specific ways how, how that can be accelerated or better done using you know, data science and machine learning? Different yeah, so so I think uh, searching the um, like a needle in the hay is common, right, for all those things. And basically, yeah. it means that you for all this kind of problem, you need a good set of data to begin with, right? And then you also need um, methods allow you to uh, go beyond what you have, right? So I think from the methodology point of view, for example, Bayesian optimization is useful for both kinds of problems, okay? Um, but the, on the other hand, the differences is in the representation. So if you want to do a design that has the, the upper scale level is deterministic, but the lower scale level is um, like a stochastic, right? It just means that you need to use multiple representation at different scale level, right? Which is fine, which is not a problem. Um, I think the challenge is more about how do you compute them in the way, because sometimes we do have a homogenization assumption, you know, for some system, right? So in some cases you have to use uh, like a all-in-one direct numerical simulation in order to compute very tough properties such as damage, you know, damaging behavior, mm. right? Many of us mm. here might be interested in. So I think there's always a question about how big is the unit cell, right, you can have. That, that, that question never goes away. I mean, that question is depending on what is the property of interest. But at least from the design perspective, you can think of this as like design is really provide you a guidance, like what is important, right, to you. And then you can allocate uh, better. But from the design research point of view, we're not designing only the artifact. We're designing the process because we're designing mm -hmm. the sampling, right? So yeah. it's a trade-off between design the sample. There's also a trade-off. It's, it's a big problem if we want to formulate the problem correctly. It is designing the artifact together with designing the information's gathering path, okay? Um, and together, and you kind of, you know, so that these are the questions that the people in my field are very interested in, like to, to, to look at it. Yeah. So I also have a question if, if, if we still have time. So, um... So, Hendrik, is that okay? Sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. So, I also have some question about the connection between the matter material and the 3D printing. So, let's say theoretically we find the, the optimum topology for a matter material, but the printing itself generates a lot of residual stress or porosity or those kind of artifacts, and then the, the, the screaming path. Uh, also, deep, uh, also change a lot of those properties. So, how to connect the theoretical uh, optimum topology in, and incorporate the printing in the process? Like, just what uh, way you just mentioned, it's not the uh, it's not the product itself, but also the manufacture process. So, how yeah. do? Yeah. So, if you have a fantastic simulation code, then you can yeah. actually simulate. The, uh, the input, the impact of process, right, on the different locations. But on the other hand, I think most of the current process, like a simulation, they look at how the microstructure evolved, but not necessarily the defects. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another thing, right? Because defects occur outside of your thinking, you know, sometimes, right? But it, it, mm -hmm. it occurred and because it's a reality. So that's where the physical experiment is also useful that you need to 
not only simulate how the microstructure evolved, but also how the voids, the defects evolved, mm -hmm. right, at different locations. But you can do this. You cannot really afford to do this in the in the like a uh, uh, like a in a in a way that you simulate everything. Okay, so that's mm -hmm. where the statistics comes in. That you have the phenomenon and you have the statistics and you do sampling. You know, in a way that allow you to predict, right? To predict some yeah. behavior with uncertainty. But I haven't seen uh, the reason I say I haven't seen any work really can do topology optimization. Okay? Yeah together with manufacturing process. The reason is because um, that the, the loop, right, is, is a loop issue, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. the topology will continue to evolve and then the, the, the material will be different. But I think it, the gap will be smaller if we are, we are able to find a surrogate model at different stage, you know, of this process and then use them in the way that can accomplish, you know, what we want to accomplish. But it's an open question. I tell you, frankly, that I haven't seen anyone can deal with yeah. that. There's already people who derive uh, due to topological optimization by consider some manufacturer uh, impact, but not in the, in, in the direct way. It's more like do some gradient calculation considering yeah. some manufacturing impact, yeah. I also think one of the issue is that the dimensions of the parameter is so high you have the laser power laser speed how do you pin the how do you move the laser everything so even you have the simulation tools even i'm not talking about the physical tests just to try to simulate some of them to get a sense of the sampling would be very expensive right yeah but i i really see some work not intending to do design process but try to consider the process impact you know there's a lot of work there, like model the voids as a random variable, right, uh -huh, in the structure. Yeah. But it's not the designing the process, but just kind of taking the process as is, but how do I, you know, model the impact of that? Those work already there, yeah. Yeah, maybe fixing some of the parameter and then just test one of them may also possible, yeah. but to, yes, yeah, yeah. to explore all of them yeah, may yeah. be very difficult. Yes. All right. Well, maybe the, the very last question for today is uh, coming from Azadi. How an optimum random heterogeneous microstructure can be manufactured? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so a lot of the, the process is actually will lead to random heterogeneous microstructure. So I give example, like a mixing process for polymer, right? And so everything like produced in mass quantity uh, I think I have a slide that shows that uh, there's some different process leads to different, like fo focused ion beam, phase separation, nano wrinkling. All those process will lead to non-deterministic structure at the end. They will be, uh, oh, th maybe I misunderstood the question. How an optimal random, uh, how and okay, yeah. So I think, yeah, if you're talking about random heterogeneous microstructure, it's the, this kind of system. Yeah, so we're trying to create a, a mapping between the, the, this random structure to the processing variable. Um, that, like the one that I showed in the nano wrinkling problem. You know, we're doing normal mapping between the process condition with the structure variables. Even though it, it is random heterogeneous, there's still some pattern or function can represent those kind of structure and can be mapped to, um, to the processing conditions. Yeah. Quasi-random structure. Okay, there's another question, calculate absorption. Yeah, we use, uh, in this case, is a collaboration with uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Chen, Professor Chen Sun, using um, uh, like uh, the com uh, COMSOL to do the multi-physics calculation of the absorption. So that is a Maxwell-based physics, you know, based process, yeah. If you look at the paper, uh, we may have some details there. It's published in, in both the scientific report as well as the structural multidisciplinary optimization. Yeah. Sounds great. Uh, um, yeah, another yeah. question, uh, when you do the reconstruction, do you need to consider symmetry? No. Actually, we're looking for method which can uh, to to uh, reconstruct uh, uh, anisotropic 
if that's you know what you're talking about. And it's tropic versus isotropic. It could be used to those deep learning, machine learning technique, they they don't necessarily assume that it's isotropic or any symmetry. And oh. if you rotate the pattern well, the property change, uh, it depends on your load condition, right? Um, that what kind of load condition you have, whether it will change or not. Oh, sorry. So my question is like, so when you get your initial like microstructure, the original pattern, so like uh, during the, uh, when you collect this pattern, so uh, is it possible that so if you rotate this pattern, they, they still belong to the same objects? In this case, probably in your machine learning modeling, in your pattern, in your pattern learning like scheme, you also need to consider this like a rotational invariance. Oh, you mean from the machine learning point of view, whether it's important that you orient your uh, sample in certain way, or would that change the result? Right? Yeah. Is that your question? Yes. Um, I think. I think it probably will. It especially if I said that the you know depends on the property of interest. You know, mm -hmm. if you certain property of interest. <clears throat> So if it's light absorption, it depends on the angle of the light, right? So um, uh, it, it will change if you do a different orientation, if your computation um, of the load of the boundary condition, what I mean is, um, um, is orientation sensitive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um... Yeah. All, um... Yeah, thank you everyone for your participation. I think the, one of the purpose I understand of this institute is facilitate interdisciplinary collaboration. So if you want to reach out to me, you know, if you see anything that like a uh, worse collaboration and the re uh, feel free to reach out to me and I will be very glad to speak to you and to also understand your work, um, your work more. Thank you yeah. so much. Yeah. Thanks everyone and, and have a have a great day and uh, yeah, yeah let's thank Wei Chen very much again for the for the very insightful yeah thanks for inviting me yeah bye now thank you so